Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Samuel Zinner in the Mountain Village of Aula, Italy. Welcome to Just Nowhere. Today, we have a very special guest, Professor Dean Rickles, University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, thank you for being here, Dean. Welcome. Yes, um, your work, most people are going to be aware of if they haven't read uh, your publications, of course, going to be from online interviews. And uh, there's a, a your interview, a very short one with Mr. Kuhn, right, close to the truth on the question of, well, his, it's, it seems a, a, a lifelong preoccupation of his, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, it's, it's, mm. it's a very uh, intriguing interview, uh, but of course, all too brief, but that's of the nature of, of the format um, of his show. But I wanted to try to start off with that basic question, but to try to probe s some of the details, right, at, at, at greater mm -hmm. philosophical uh, and perhaps even like scientific or cosmological depth. So you, you mm. pointed out rightly that in response to a question like that, the universe is an instance of being rather than being as such. So we're, all, we're immediately, right, we're in the realm of what philosophy calls ontology. And uh, the next uh, point that you made, of course, is, is to point out, I guess, the general view that the question itself, uh, you know, one can assail it as involving a, a circular, it's a circular logic question. And um, so let's start off it, with it, that. Can, can you, can, can you uh, go over why that is susceptible to the... the the charge of being a circular. Uh, yeah, it can be circular. I mean, it depends on how you're viewing what um, an explanation consists of. So obviously the way the question is being posed, it looks like any other question, any other explanation seeking sure. I question where you have, you would expect as a response, a set of premises and a conclusion, the conclusion of which would be there is existence or being or something like that. But obviously, because of the nature of the um, the thing that's being explained, which is a totality, it's everything, um, mm -hmm. it must logically include what you have to put in the premises to get it out. So it's always going to be a, there's always going to be a circularity in that sense. There's no premises of any argument that you could put in that would get out being that wasn't already included in being, given the nature of being. That's the circularity. Yes, uh, I, I know there's a, there's another uh, semantic problem uh, involved in, in this subject because the the nothingness right of physics, right, for instance, Krauss's mm -hmm. uh, uh, quantum mm -hmm. foam. Right, uh, yeah. is does not coincide with philosophy's notion of absolute nothingness, right? And in fact, yeah. for a physicist, there is there, there can be no absolute nothingness. It, uh, yeah. they don't go there. It's it's just not logically fitting. It's not coherent, which I guess from uh, uh, some philosophical angles. Um, Actually, would probably be congruent, right, with the with the old uh, Aristotelian notion of the eternity of the world, right? So it sort of bypasses the, one of the logical problems there. And I know that George F. Uh, R. Ellis, right? Uh, I don't know if you've heard it, but his it's online. His 2012 uh, Copernicus lecture, where he mm -hmm. uh, really uh, takes Lawrence Krauss to task, right? For for well, it's not easy easy to do. Not for being a bad physicist, but for being a bad philosopher, right? Um, yeah. So, um, but he points out, Ellis points out that, strictly speaking, just, for, just from uh, you know, a scientific point of view, the, the, the point of view that physicists operate from, when we look at the so-called Big Bang, right, this, of course, right, is not actually the beginning of the universe and the physics models. There's something that happens before, right, and there are different theories about that. Inflation is a, you know, a popular one, though, it's, though it is increasingly contested, but, you know, we'll see where that goes. But um, mm. his main point, I believe it's, it's the same one 
I think that uh, S- Sabina Hassenfelder uh, has recently made, and that is right. Where you do reach the limits of the scientific method and where science can probe at a certain point, and uh, beyond that, it just seems that uh, to go further back, right, which is metaphorical way of speaking, right, to go before the before, which is really you know, a bizarre thought in itself, uh, you know, one then has to really rely on philosophy, analytical philosophy, and theology also goes there, but I would imagine good theology is going to have to be based on good philosophy. And um, so Ellis ends up pointing out that we really can't know, uh, certainly at this point we don't, and perhaps in principle we couldn't, we can't even know, uh, if there was actually a beginning, right? Okay. So the, the eternity, the eternal model is, remains a possibility, right? So this yeah. is, mm-hmm. so how would you? Yeah, there's some that? interesting, yeah. I mean, there's a, a lot of interesting um, history of cosmology on this question of the, of the beginning. So there was a famous debate in the 1950s, mm-hmm. 1940s and 50s, over this big bang theory because a lot of physicists thought that it um precisely left too much scope for uh religious elements to creep in Hmm. but um so the the there was a competitor theory known as the steady state theory which is an eternal theory plays that there's just been this expansion and constant creation so sometimes called the constant creation or continuous creation model has just no initial point at which it happened and we can explain all of the same kind of expansion that we see using this model without needing this strange initial almost like a genesis Mm. point you know where everything emerges from we don't need it in physics and it leaves too much space for a, a creator and obviously you know you have to remember that that big bang model was developed in the first place by um, uh, a priest by um, Le Maitre, a priest right. at MIT, so who, who knew perfectly well the, the um, theological implications of the Big Bang model when he came up with that model. Um, mm-hmm. So, but there are—I don't know whether it, it's it. We necessarily need to view it as a boundary. I mean, it's a boundary on present knowledge, but it's not a boundary on whether we can consider models that could go beyond the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. There are a whole bunch of recent um, approaches. There there are some from string theory. Yes. Uh, There's a a model called Big Bang String Cosmology, where it uses certain um, mathematical properties of strings, this thing called conformal symmetry, to show that as you go through, as you get smaller and smaller, you go through the the Big Bang boundary and you sort of come out the other side. There's a sort of uh, strange development like that. Um, Roger Penrose has a very similar um, theory of conformal cyclic cosmology, which uses a very similar, the same mathematics, essentially, this uh, idea of conformal symmetry where you can't tell the difference um, between large scales and small scales, basically. Yes. So, so Penrose's idea is that as you get, as the universe goes towards its end, and everything becomes this kind of thermal radiation, it sort of becomes photons. And photons don't have mass. And mm-hmm. if you don't have mass, you don't have a scale. So that allows him to do this strange sort of rescaling of the large to the small. And he starts what he calls a new eon, basically. So he has these um, very, um, yeah, sort of eternal recurrence kind of eons that, that happen. Mm-hmm. But he thinks that you can find evidence for it. In the you would be able to find evidence in the background radiation, the cosmic microwave background radiation, because there would be concentric circles. And he, I mean, he thought that they'd been found at one stage. They they, mm-hmm. they haven't. That you know, right. still not got any empirical support. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole bunch of models. There's a, there's another one called the Ekpyrotic model of some guys at the Perimeter yes. Institute in Canada, Turok and Steinhardt, I think Neil mm-hmm. Turok. So there's there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can attack the problem of this of this beginning and show Mm -hmm. but as you were saying at the beginning of the when you were talking about krauss's notion of nothingness all it would reveal i expect is that that wasn't nothing it's not creation from nothing 
there's something else going on. It's happening in a larger structure, right? Because all of these models are taking place on the assumption that there's a quantum vacuum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. a quantum vacuum is about as far from a nothing as you can possibly get. It's a seething, constant um, bath of energy and motion, mm -hmm. right? So, yes. so um, Lawrence Krauss's whole idea is that you utilize the energy in that quantum vacuum and you utilize this thing called the Heisenberg energy, energy time uncertainty relations, which say that if you've got a small enough um, duration of time, you can have very large energy fluctuations. If you take it right down to the tiniest, then you can have huge energy fluctuations, mm -hmm. which could include the fluctuation that becomes our universe. Yes. So that's um, obviously not a thing in, mm -mm, in yes. the philosophy, set, as you say. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, it's plausible enough, right? His theory, uh, but where where it breaks down, as I've already intimated, right, is then when he says, therefore, right, we have no need of the, of a theological model, right, because mm. we can now explain how we get something from nothing, and the the main yeah. category error there is that what theology or religion means by nothingness is not what he's talking about. Exactly. Right? So, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so in any case, so do you think that, uh, uh, I know she's quite popular now uh, on YouTube, but Sabina Hassenfelder, do you think she's being a little too harsh uh, when she calls um, these various theories like Penrose is the one you mentioned? And, and um, there's a plethora of these theories that go, you know, quote unquote, before the beginning. And uh, she just says, mm -hmm. these are not falsifiable. They're just not, they're all scientific. Right, is, is the phrase that she likes to do, to be a little kind, I suppose, rather than call them pseudoscience or just religion. Uh, but uh, she calls them basically all scientific because they're not falsifiable. I see the problem right away with Penrose because he does have at least an yeah. argument that where in principle, right, there is a falsifiability, a, a conceivable one. He thought he found it at one point, but it wasn't really confirmed. Uh, but, um, uh, and... Yeah, I think... Um Go on. Uh, well, the uh, uh, as for uh, string theory, um, I listened to um, a debate, if you will, between various physicists uh, uh, featuring M Max Tedmark, and uh, the these consensus of this, and this is something I found on YouTube. And, and of course, if you haven't heard it, you can't speak to how I will be characterizing it, but the basic gist of it was, and it was explicitly suggested that maybe we should jettison Popper's whole requirement of falsifiability, since we can't find any real evidence, proof for our whole, you know, the string model, the string theory, after so many decades. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's time to jettison, you know, this notion of the requirement of falsifiability, which I think is just absolutely uh you know an act of desperation and this is right an online thing it's not in a i'm sure they, they probably wouldn't go there in a peer-reviewed uh you know publication but this is what they're actually suggesting in their um how would we call it their uh you know um, you know among friends speaking mm -hmm. as professionals mm -hmm. though so um yeah well i mean Look, so in in the philosophy of science, um, Popper's methodology is not considered to be uh, historically accurate. It's been found to not describe how scientists actually operate. Right. They don't go around trying to falsify mm -hmm. their theories. Very often, they will work with inconsistent theories for a while if it works. Like, you know, Rutherford's theory of the atom was known to have this problem where the electrons would spiral into the nucleus if they're continuously emitting radiation, mm -hmm. but you can still work with it for a bit. So they'll, sure. they'll, they will generally adopt whatever works regardless of whether it's falsifiable for a while. And there's this idea of um, obviously the most famous um, recent um, methodology of science is that of Thomas Kuhn, which is, yes. it's kind of false falsificationist, but mm -hmm. it says it takes a little bit of time before you build up enough tension with the world and with the back theories before you say, okay, that one is now on the scrap heap. We'll get rid of that one now. Yes. But, but there are other elements of theories as well, which um, I don't know, they seem to sort of escape 
um, escape the the tendrils of falsification anyway. So if you've got other reasons to believe in a theory, mm -hmm. and that theory has other implications, mm -hmm. then you have sort of secondary reasons to believe in those implications. So one a, a common example is Newton's idea of absolute space. So you can't observe yes. absolute space. But what you can observe are a whole bunch of other features of the theory that are empirically very well verified. His laws of mechanics work very well. His law of gravitation works very well. The only way for it to work, however, is that it has this underlying assumption of an absolute space. So you can sort of um, access something that's invisible mm -hmm. by looking at things that are visible and using this the um, logical connections between the invisible and the visible bits. So there might be something similar going on in some of the... Uh, these proposals that are being mm -hmm. uh, put around, where they they merge well with, for example, quantum field theory and what we know about cosmology, and maybe they have these other implications. I mean, sure. so one example of this would be the multiverse or the idea of an ensemble of worlds. Mm -hmm. So there you have you mentioned inflationary cosmology. One of the implications of that theory, if true, would be the existence of these kind of pocket universes that have different constants of nature and things like this again we're not going to see that we're going to be confined to one particular pocket but the theory has it as an implication and we have reason to believe the theory so we should have reason to believe the implications regardless of whether they're observable or not mm -hmm. so uh, there are cases that can be made that you're not necessarily violating falsifiability you're saying that there's things that go beyond falsifiability mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as how I would well, put it. <clears throat> well getting back to to your, your brief uh interview at least the excerpt from from a longer one i suppose that that you had with with kuhn uh you got to the the subject of logic and numbers right so in in any possible uh world <clears throat> uh we would have uh num numbers logic Right. And uh, George Ellis, uh, in, in his uh, 2012 Copernicus lecture, also, he also right, tries to go before the, the beginning. Right. But he doesn't mm -hmm. do it through the route of physics. He, he, he then relies on logic and philosophy, which he seems to be better at than, than some of his uh, colleagues. Right. But um, so, as you know, he talks about the various possibility spaces. Right, so the, the possibility space of logic, right, and and so I think a subset of that would include numbers and and, and numerical structures, especially. Uh, but also he also talks about uh, the the possibility space for the laws of physics. I know that's a that's a big subject. Yeah. Are they descriptive or merely or, right, uh, and also the possibility space of morality, right, which which is very intriguing. And he of course he doesn't confuse morality with cultural bound systems of ethics, right? Which, which can mm -hmm. be flawed and be different, but morality in these almost like, uh, law-like, yes, yes, it, it, what's right and what's wrong, right? So uh, different uh, cultural systems of ethics, uh, you know, have some, you know, you know can, uh, some of them will uh, 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 permit uh, various forms of birth control, others don't. But everyone agrees you can't go out and start killing people. And uh, if you do, there are consequences. So this is, this is what Ellis means, right, by the distinction between mm -hmm. morality and ethics. And, uh, of course, I know it's a matter of semantics because not everyone is going to subscribe to his terminology. But I think they may have, you know, the same basic idea. So he goes before the beginning. And uh, what he sees there is this, this, what he calls the possibility space. Right. And so mm -hmm. there you can have mathematical structure, uh, structures and logic. And now that takes me to uh, a question I want to pose to you about uh, going back to Tegmark, right? His uh, theory of the mathematical universe. Right. So um, how how can how is this uh, the naysayers? How what is the what are their arguments? Um, against Tegmark's mathematical universe, that math, the mathematics is not necessarily 
merely describe the universe, but that's what the universe mm -hmm. is. Are, are you aware of, of cogent yeah. objections? Um, yeah, the, the, I mean, the, there's one um, primary objection, which is, so Tegmark's, Tegmark's view is he has this hierarchy of, of ensemble, hierarchy of possible world scenarios. Mm -hmm. So one is similar to the one we mentioned in the inflationary cosmology, there's the quantum mechanics one. There's the, I think it's the string landscape. And then there's this radical approach, which is all possible mathematical structures. So you're talking about probably the, the uh, level four multiverse, which is all possible mathematical structures. Obviously what characterizes, and this is the problem, what characterizes a mathematical structure is that it's not concrete. Yes. So this is why... In the interview with um, Tom, with um, Kuhn, um, we were talking about um, the fact that numbers are necessary. And the reason why they're necessary is because they're not concrete. They're not pinned down to concrete reality. Um, so the standard objection for Tegmark's view is that we appear to be um, in a concrete reality here. So there's the, this mismatch between concrete structures and abstract structures. So the so that's the objection. I mean, um, Tegmark has a has a, a, a response to this, which is that there are in these mathematical in his mathematical universe there are self-aware substructures, which f feel like they're concrete beings. It's almost like a kind of um, that they would be in a simulation or something like that, <laughs> where they feel like they're more than simple, abstract mathematical structure. But within the structure, they're not going to know any different. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what you think about that as a response. I don't know what other response he could give other than that response. Right. That that's the and, and you could make the same um, make the same objection. You know, Berkeley. And idealism face exactly mm -hmm. the same kind of objection. Yes. If the if reality is just the mind, I you know ideas, possibilities like this. Well, then you know I can go over here and kick a stone and refute you as D Dr. Johnson did. Yes. But it's not a refutation because you, we're both in the system in the same system. Right. right. The rock is an idea. The toe is an idea. <laughs> the pain is an idea. And it's the yes. same for these self-aware substructures and tag marks. Um, mm -hmm mathematical universe. Yeah, I, uh, there's another model I find more plausible, at least philosophically, and, and I think just from the point of view of physics, and, and that would, be, and it's, again, there's some, it's not a finished system yet, but that's Nima Arkane Hamid. Uh, he, he wrote a book with several colleagues on, on like the uh, Grossmannian uh, matrices, but uh, it, the popular lecture that he gives is various instantiations of it on YouTube is the end of space time. And his basic uh, spiel or is the basic trope is this, is that uh, we start off with gluon interactions, right? So two gluons can interact with a single one, a single one can, can alternatively interact with two, right? So you start with these triadic structures of gluons and these begin to amalgamate, right? Form amalgamations. And he points out that <clears throat> One of these single, if you look at the amalgamation, but if you zero in on one of the single uh, triadic blocks, if you will, mm -hmm. these lack space time and quantum mechanics. Right? But if you look uh, at the amalgamation at this point, then we have space time and quantum mechanic uh, properties. And so his general hypothesis um, is that mathematical structures, that is the various combinatorial permutations, the various ways the gluons can react, um, mm -hmm. are generated, may generate space-time quantum mechanics. So we get to our physical material world being generated from what he calls mathematical structures, the various possible permutations of the relations <clears throat> between these um, gluon amalgamations. And, but what, uh, how, does he view, how does he view his gluons and the forces well, between them? <clears throat> Well, you know, he, he doesn't really go into much detail in his public lectures on this, but of course there's a lot more detail in the in the book that he wrote on, on gross many matrices. But his his the way he sets it up is this, right? He says uh, to, to get an idea of these 
permutations, right? To think of it mathematically, or let's set up a row of uh, integers, one through five, one through six at the bottom on top, right? We're gonna have another set of the same numbers. And uh, let's say number one on the bottom is then going to interact and meet up with four at the top. And, you know, so you get these crisscrossing interactions and all the various ways this is going to happen, right? It immediately looks like a combinatorial situation in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, um, uh, I don't believe that he would confine this just to the gluons. But this type of uh, combinatorial uh, per possible permutations, right, is, is what these mathematical structures are, which he sees as the way to get to space-time and quantum mechanics. And so the, the title of his, his popular lectures is a bit odd to me because the, the end of space time is really, I think, talking about how to, do you get there? How, you know, yeah, so he's explaining yeah, space time, right? But the end, I can see his point, the end of space time, what he really means by that is, all right, so how, if we're working backwards, so how do we yeah. explain the origin of it? Because before the origin is not there, right? So in that sense, Right, the, the end of space time. So there, his argument is different from Tegmark's uh, insofar mm -hmm. as you ha he has the mathematical structures generating, right, the, the concrete, right, level of a cosmos. So just uh, apart from the physics of that and the unfinished part of it, which he, he, he acknowledges the, the, they're not quite there yet, they haven't explained how you can generalize this, but, um, right, because it's really, you have those two sets of integers, so that's one dimension of space and one dimension of time, right? So you have to be able to generalize that to the actual world we live in. But, but logically yeah. or philosophically viewed, that's my question, that, does that make more sense, right, that mathematical structures could generate concrete objects than I, Ted Mark's model? I don't think so, because it's, it almost reminds me of that probably the most famous Sam Harris cartoon where mm -hmm. he's doing an equation on the blackboard. And then he says, and then at this point, a miracle happens. It's the ah. idea of how do you, what, what point do you go? Is there a, a discrete switch from abstract to concrete where it gets a certain, when it has a certain complexity, that's when, just then. I mean, I, I can't, unless they, unless they can show that. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how possible that they could show that. I mean, there's a similar problem with, um, it sounds very similar to Raphael Sorkin's causal set theory, where you start with what are essentially um, space atoms, and you imagining you imagine sprinkling them in a certain way, and they've got certain causal relations, and that's all. Mm -hmm. And they have the same problem, which is the continuum limit. How do you get to the continuum limit where you have the thing that looks like the space time we inhabit? Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't have a response for that still. And I think they would this other approach you're mentioning would face the same continuum limit right I, they would not be able to demonstrate that continuum limit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i don't think so right this I, I, yeah i per personally agree with you uh it has uh the same point you're making there i guess could be expressed uh, in uh, synonymous terminology right there's an explanatory gap mm -hmm. uh, remaining and that has that has not been filled and it's somewhat analogous perhaps to you know the the uh it's ubiquitous in the field today, the so-called hard problem of consciousness, right? There's this explanatory gap. And my, my friend Gregory uh, Chaitin, the mathematical philosopher, the way he explains mm -hmm. this is, uh, you know, we're really hard pressed to, to if, we, if we start from, um, let's say, consciousness is fundamental. If we start there, we're hard pressed to explain the, the origin of matter. And... Yeah turn it around. If we, if we start from uh, the point of view of materialism, then we're hard pressed to explain the origin of the non-concrete of, of consciousness. Though, you know, there are a lot of theories that try to do that, but as far mm -hmm. as I'm aware, uh, there's always this explanatory gap and, you know, yeah. and the like emergent consciousness and all these various theories right, are possibilities. Sure. I granted that, but it, I don't think that anyone has really explained it. I think the latest attempt, I don't know if you've uh, read the paper, uh, Lahav and Nima, uh, on a, a relativistic theory of consciousness. And they have this grand claim that, oh, we have finally, we have solved, 
we have answered the hard problem of consciousness. It seems that almost every paper, right, has this theory, these, this, this claim these days, but it's basically taking Einstein's theory of relativity, right, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, so we have uh, the first and third person consciousness being compared to the different, uh, the, let's say the twin paradox, for instance, involving time dilation. Mm -hmm. So time is passing at different rates, right, for two different individuals. So these are compared to the first and third person. It seems to me that this theory merely describes first person and third person consciousness interaction or relationship and is not really telling us, you know, what, what really is consciousness, uh, the functions, the origins. It's just, uh, it seems a good analogy creative, innovative, but I don't think by any, uh, I, uh, I just can't imagine that it's solved the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, but it, yeah, seems, I don't think. Yeah, it seems that all theories are there. There's an explanatory gap. So um, uh, this, this brings me now to another subject that, that you've uh, dealt with, uh, and that is the whole issue of time and the block world. Um, the, yeah. the question of the block world. Uh, yesterday, I did an interview with a, a block world proponent, uh, Veselin Petkov, right? Oh, yeah. At the yeah, Minkowski Institute Montreal. Here in Montreal. Yeah. All right. So, you know, it's work. Now, his argument is that actually, like the kinematic effects of special relativity, uh, like the Lorentz transformation, so the Lorentz contraction, for, for instance, of, you know, like a meter stick, for instance, or mm -hmm. the time dilation. Right, that neither of these actually the, the dynamical explanation really doesn't make sense. Like you know, the, the idea that we can explain the deformation right involved in the Lorentz transformations dynamically, uh, he would say that the you know the, the 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 coherent explanation there would be that actually what is happening is the difference in the measurements would be the result of your measuring two different slices, two different 3D slices of a 4D of the 4D world tube of the meter mm -hmm. right and that this uh may, may, makes well he wouldn't say it makes a lot more sense than the dynamical explanation he's he actually rules out he says there's no way you can explain the Lorentz transformations or uh time dilation through dynamics right Ex apart from a 4d model right um mm -hmm. so, uh, do you have any thoughts on on that claim um yeah i don't really know about know enough about um his particular work on this subject right. i mean i do know that there's a i mean there was an old debate about how to interpret um the lorentz transformations i mean in, in the beginning of mm -hmm. the um of the work on um what became special relativity there were a set of well-known transformation equations um that both lorentz and poincare and einstein were utilizing and giving giving different interpretations so the the initial approach by lorentz who found those transformations along with fitzgerald was a dynamical um explanation mm -hmm. and it was basically an ether based interpretation when things move through the ether um they feel a certain force the there are in, inner atomic forces that compress in the direction of motion and any object so you can interpret one of the same set of equations like that, or like Einstein did with this geometrical interpretation. Mm -hmm. And then, it, of course, it was Minkowski who later then gave the the actual four-dimensional yes. um, picture using a new metric. So Einstein nowhere mentions 4D or anything like that, any kind of funny stuff going on with space-time, other mm -hmm. than these dilations and contractions that he thought were to do with the different ways uh, measurement um, standards more than anything. It's more of a conventionalist approach. So I don't know what um, Veselin's view is. It sounds like he's given, giving a, almost just the standard view of how philosophers of space-time think about special relativity, which it is may, this geometric it, explanation. Yeah. yeah, it may sound like it, but uh, it, uh, it, since you're not familiar with it in detail, then I would, you know, I, I would recommend um, looking at... Um, one of his books he's he's published more than one book and of course there's there's a, there's a series that he's edited right but yeah. what he basically does in his books is he goes through the history of philosophy right so it gives the philosophical background 
to to questions of eternalism and presentism, uh, and then so he he takes a very his, historical approach, right? So covering all bases of the development of these ideas uh, in physics and philosophy, right? And then the way that he he deals with the dynamical explanations for the kinematic effects of special relativity are very detailed and related to mm. physics. So he doesn't, in, at that point, he no longer invokes anything to do with the history of philosophy. So it's, it's, it's purely mathematical and based on, on knowledge of physics. I would say that the, I would, I would say that his argument f for um, time dilation or his argument against the dynamical explanation of time dilation is, mm -hmm. is a lot more powerful, but that's just my, my own impression because I, uh, one could intuitively grasp right that you, you could get different measurements for the meter stick mm -hmm. right Be, mm -hmm. for for dynamical reasons of, of what what are called deformations right so uh, but yeah. when it comes to time dilation uh, it's it's much more difficult for me to grasp uh, how the dynamical explanation is going to work but that's just my own intuition which means nothing right um, mm -hmm. but so i but i think that for maybe uh, most people uh, would probably have the same uh, degree of of intuition on this. They'd be, they'd be able to grasp the deformation, right, effects on a meter stick. But when it comes to time lapsing at different rates for two different objects, right, dependent on the velocity and mass, you know that that's a gr uh, a greater struggle to understand and to explain both for a professional physicists and for you know a lay audience. I don't know if you want to take a, a uh, you want to try to tackle that. Well, I mean, the standard way that Einstein explained it himself was just was using um, um, sort of radar time ideas, where you're bouncing um, beams of light um, from what. So it's it's how you um, conceive of measuring time dilation. So the way he conceived of it was using these light clocks. Yes. Right? We send a beam of light from, say, we're stationary on the platform. There's a train moving. We bounce it to something in the train, and it comes back. And then we compare that to the person doing the same thing with their torch, and it bounces and comes back. And we can see that gonna, there are going to be differences in time measurements. And I th think you can have a similar intuition as you would with the space example if right. you think of it in this light clock approach rather than looking at your wristwatch and just viewing it like that, in which case it doesn't really make much mm -hmm. sense. So there are, there are many ways of measuring time, of course, and maybe not all of them um, are, in, are intuitive in the same way as Einstein's original approach. Right. Yeah. Um, well, yes, intuition at the level of intuition and, and then you know, above it slightly, of course, um, the most lay audiences are will have the knowledge about the how the GPS system works in your car in in an automobile, right? And so the 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 fact of time dilation, right, it has to be fed into all of the computers in order to adjust, mm -hmm. right, for the different time rates. Which um, <clears throat> again, it, it's it's a subject that. Um, I, we could go on at length, but it, it would then um, consume the, the entire interview. All right. So it, uh, that is what are the pros and cons of the dynamical explanations, right? In contrast to the, basically the Minkowski, right? 4D model uh, mm. uh, explanations, right? But <clears throat> um, in any case, to... Yeah, to get, to, 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 I was to, just going yes, to please, please. say something about, about the block, actually. I mean, so the, the, the standard view of this, so I suppose Veselin would say something like the three-dimensional descriptions are um, somehow less fundamental than the four-dimensional block. And the four-dimensional block is the real stuff, the invariant stuff. Is that where he goes with it? Yes, and then he invokes uh, Hermann Weyl's famous uh yeah. statement about yeah. the the, the, up the world life. that's it yes the consciousness yeah. Um, right <clears throat> yeah so i like I, I used to be um a block universe um advocate and 
for reasons going back to what you were talking about earlier with the pre big bang mm -hmm. stuff of George Ellis and so on. Um, I don't, I think it's a very bad, um, uh, way of viewing the world now because it precisely removes those possibilities. And there's a, um, so the original terminology for the block universe comes from William James. You probably know this. Yes. Yes. And he was sort of viewing it as this, um, this thing with no free play. There's no way of getting any sort of creation in that kind of block because there's just necessity and impossibility that you cannot get possibility in that kind of block world. So I, 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 um, favor something along the lines of Ellis of Ellis's approach now and a William James approach. And I don't buy this, um, the Minkowski block view anymore and the Herman Weil view anymore for that reason. And I even, yeah. And, and it even relates to the problem, the hard problem of consciousness that you mentioned mm -hmm. and the relationship between the, between mind and matter, because the, a new a viewer been developing with, um, Harold Atmansbacher, we have a recent book on dual aspect monism and the deep structure of meaning. Mm -hmm. And in that, the approach is to start with this space of possibility, which is a kind of nothing because there is no nothing actualized. It's a kind of um, nothing, a, a philosopher's kind of nothingness. Yes. And um, the idea is that this is almost like an unus mundus, a kind of unified world. And it's through the splitting of this that you get the mind matter correlations, but they're not fundamental. The fundamental thing is this space of possibilities. And there are very many ways of splitting it, just like in Spinoza's mm -hmm. um, dual aspect. Yes. So this is, a, a, we call it decompositional. It's not like Bertrand Russell's where you're building up features of the world from these neutral elements, these atoms, you start with everything. You start, oh, nothing, rather. You start yes. with the totality and you split. And then you get psychophysical correlations as a, a necessary consequence because of the way you split it. Just yes. like when you split a holistic quantum state in an entangled state, you get correlations by logical necessity. So we can sort of explain those correlations by where they're coming from. From this split right right so well that oh, um, yes mm -hmm. this reminds me of max Vellman's uh reflexive monism um it's not yeah. the same but uh, i think it's congruent in in many uh respects uh to a great mm -hmm. degree <clears throat> and uh, personally i find it one of the most uh, coherent models out there mm -hmm. right uh the whole notion that you start with a state, right? That that, for instance, Wolfgang Pauli called this uh, psychophysical, right? Yeah. One one can modify the language however one wants to, but the basic concept, I believe, is the same. So you have this unitary mm -hmm. state that then undergoes some bifurcation, right? And um, it perhaps I think it has explanatory power also because uh, it then opens the possibility for understanding certain phenomena that seem to uh, simultaneously or in some integral way to exhibit the features of both nodes in that binary. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and in this case, you, you sort of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we start off with a monism, but we end up with sort of a dualistic uh, binary, right, a framework. Yes. But I know dualism, yeah. that, that's a loaded term, right? <laughs> but, um, well, uh, yes. What's interesting about the particular approach we have is that it's both monist and dualist, but it's ontologically monist and epistemically dualist. Yeah, yes. So yes. the split is merely epistemic. Right. So, it, yeah, it resolves a whole bunch of puzzles. And you're right that you can explain all sorts of features. You can explain things like synchronicities. So Pauli... One of the things we discuss in the book is the Pauli Jung correspondence. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so Pauli was very much concerned, like Jung, with explaining synchronicities. So they adopted pretty much exactly this viewpoint. So mm -hmm. it, these are one of the chapters of the book, that, right? The idea, and they even use the Pauli used the quantum mechanical analogy. Yes. We find the same thing in um, in David Bohm, who's been doing some work with Basil Hailey. 
where again it's the same concept the language changes slightly so bo mm -hmm. speaks of the implicate order which is basically again this space of possibilities there's no yes. thing hood or anything like that but it's not um it's not a state there's a sort of process involved in Bohm's view mm -hmm. of how we get from implicate order to what we find manifested in the explicate order. Yes. And he calls this hollow, hollow movement. So it, it builds up a whole new set of terminology and so on, but it's exactly the same viewpoint. There's a totality, yes. you split it and you get what's manifest. And there's always a subject and there's always an object reflecting it. Mm -hmm. And in this way, you sort of, you can, I mean, there are, there are two ways of solving that problem you mentioned earlier of the relationship between the mind and the matter. There's either a cyclic view, which is also quite interesting, I think, where each is bringing the other into existence. So, mm -hmm. so one of the other people we consider in the book is John Wheeler and Eddington, mm -hmm. who have this view that um, where there's, a, there's a process going on where in asking questions of the world you're playing some role in bringing about what actually happens objectively mm. but by, by the same token that objective structure is determining your particular nature and what happens to you so mm. he calls it a meaning circuit each is sort of building the other in this in this circuit eddington has a, sim a kind of similar idea where he mm -hmm. thinks that what we're doing when we're doing science and um doing our measurements of the world is basically almost a kind of self-analysis, mm -hmm. right? We're observing, we find, we're, we keep finding our own footprint, basically, whenever we're doing scientific research, we've, we've put it partially mm -hmm. there. So there's, a, so this is, there's either a cyclic view or there's this, you have this fundamental thing and it emerges from, from the split. So the cyclic, uh, could you also call that sort of a, a loop process? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, exactly. mutually it's a, mutually reinforcing loop process. Like yeah. uh, that brings to mind, uh, you know, uh, the German philosopher uh, Ernst Kosser, it's Neo Kantian, his, his theory of language, and well, in his book mm -hmm. Language and Myth, but his theory of the relationship between language and consciousness that they mutually reinforce each other and you know, looking at it from from a linguist point of view, a cognitive uh, point of view. Right, um, human consciousness uh, it, it's quite complex, but we see that it, ha it it sort of runs parallel to the complexity of our ability to produce speech right, and the complex mm -hmm. grammar and syntax. And so, uh, for instance, what is thought? Right, it seems to me, I know some will disagree, but my own personal experience is that thought for me is just an unspoken speech. I, you know, and and Chomsky would say that the thought process, together with uh, spoken speech, those are both outward parts of the language system. The inward mm -hmm. is not the silent thought; is not think; is not human ability to think, but is what we could call the unconscious, or some may perhaps call it the subconscious. But that is what is totally hidden and inaccessible to us. And so, the outward part mm -hmm. of language is the silent thought and speech. And now he doesn't uh, necessarily agree with my idea that this um, silent speech is necessarily grammatical or syntactical. It is for me, but for him, he says, for him, that's largely imagistic uh, and other types uh, of, of non-verbal, non-audible yeah. speech. But, yeah. uh, you well, know... I suppose it would depend on, on your training i mean i think there are there's there are various um different ways of getting a bit lower into that mm -hmm. subconscious and in each case it's a set a different set of symbols this relates to the casira approach you're, yes. you're using a different set of symbols if you're um a musician for example mm -hmm. you can get a bit closer you can use dreams to probe a bit further down or poetry or art or some sort of mis religious experience in each case you're just trying to get a little bit further down Yes. Um, by jettisoning conceptual content, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is sort of uh, a bit more related to this split between subject and object. Yes. So the, the more you get rid of this conceptual content, the closer you're getting down to this totality. Yes. But I don't think you can ever get there, ever. Yes. Because mm -hmm. 
Well, you, you can't yeah, have the way a, experience yeah. or know it. Right, right. But yeah. there's, no, there's never a direct access, even though we can. There are certain techniques, as you've mentioned, that can sort of activate data in the unconscious to sort of come up to higher levels and then we can grasp it. I mean, I know, I, I know Einstein and I think Newton also had this little trick they used with the coin when they, they weren't able to solve a certain problem, right? They would oh. sit down and go to sleep. And when they were holding a coin, mm. the, right? And uh, when it dropped, it wake mm. them up and, and, you know, chances are they would have the solution and they could write it down and then go to sleep. Yeah. But uh, the point I was making about the mutually reinforcing loop is uh, Kassir's idea that as language develops, as it becomes more complex, so the ability, of, so consciousness also becomes more complex. And so they reinforce mm -hmm. each other. And then, of course, you right. can look at it from the point of the view of the question, which came first. But I think that the answer to that question is the model the, that you're developing, actually. The, I mean, the general type of model, and that is you have to start off with something that is more primary than the two nodes of that binary yeah. from which both yeah. nodes emerge, right? And so that's, that's the real interesting question, um, philosophically, I think scientifically uh, and yeah. as well. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, going back right to the beginning, uh, the thing that we're talking about, which was the this problem of trying to explain why there's something rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. Leibniz makes pretty much the same point that you're making here, which is that you can't try and explain what uh, the manifest reality from within the manifest reality. So you can't try and explain the thing you're explaining using that very thing that you're trying to explain. So you have to go el find it elsewhere. It's a Unless you do a circuit. <clears throat> yes. Well, the way I like to describe this uh, is is uh, is through analogy, right? So, b because of the physical structure of our eyes, our retina, cornea, and all this, when at night we look at a particularly low magnitude star, if we look at it directly, it fades from our field of vision. So we have to look at it on the periphery, and it comes into view. Mm. And so, certain ways of reasoning are analogically similar. That is. Sometimes if we try to solve the problem head on directly through our, what would be called ratio, right? Um, we can't tackle it. And so we have to uh, find some other way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. And that would be some indirect way, right? And there are all sorts of indirect ways. Even mathematics can be an indirect way of, mm -hmm. of trying to tackle some of these hard cognitive, uh, to, you know, because the, the structure of our thinking is binary. And we can produce syntheses, of course, or that's, that's a, a fundamental basis of logic, right? But mm -hmm. Uh, at the same time, even when we when we when we achieve syntheses, it's still within a binary system, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're really not. I don't believe we're really uh, getting to the more primary state from which you know our ability to to operate in this binary state of cognition emerges. And so, mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons too that uh, I think we start hitting. A cognitive or epistemological block, right? When we go back to the origins of everything, uh, because thought, uh, which is sort of a mirror of language and vice versa, are mm. it the uh, thought and language are totally bound within the categories and the boundaries of space and time. So it's it's basically a spatial temporal uh, tool that we use. And so if we then ask, well, what comes before the beginning? Now we're talking, we're alluding to something that is actually beyond those barriers. And so we can't think about it. We can't think about yeah. it, at least not directly, right? And, yeah. and uh, so here is where the, the miracle, quote unquote, of like logic, right, comes, comes uh, into, into service, right? That seemingly can stretch those limits within uh, the limitations yeah, yeah. is dialectical, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it brings us back to, to Ellis's uh, space of possibilities, right? Um, which I find in incredibly helpful. In other words, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most powerful explanatory models out there currently, right? Mm -hmm. And I think most people can go along with him when he's talking about the laws of physics in, in, in that regard. Um, and also 
I think even he talks about the possibility space of meaning. I think a lot of people could even go with him there uh, because if you set up this, this, this formula, all right, so morality does not equal ethics. So, we, so mm -hmm. there's a logical, uh, well, there's a possibility space for morality, not to be confused with ethics. All right, so <clears throat> the possibility space of meaning. So the term meaning is not to be confused with many things it can be confused with depending on the individual. For instance, he doesn't mean human ideas, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, things that we attribute based on our cultures. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what do you, how, how would, uh, do you have an idea here of, uh, could you help me with this? I've been struggling with it. All right, so. The, the, the possibility space of morality does not coincide with the possibility space of ethics. So when he says, mm -hmm. when he talks about the possibility space of meaning, that does not coincide with what? Um, I would imagine something like understanding or, I don't know. I mean, what's the, what's the standard thing that people think of when they think of meaning? Um, that's the Something issue. like an assignment, assignment of a value of some kind, an assignment yes. of a. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, one thing means another thing. Right. So this is really a question: What does Ellis mean by meaning when he talks about the possibility mm -hmm. space of meaning? So do, do you? Yeah, it's have a relation. A it's usually, a, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's usually a relation. The way the way we do it in the in the um, the book I mentioned with Harold Atmansbacher. So the subtitle for that is uh, "And the Deep Structure of Meaning." So mm -hmm. the way we view it is there is um, there is latent meaning in that space of possibilities from which the split into subject and object is um, generated. Mm. Um, it's, but it's really hard because what you want to do is think in temporal terms and things emerging from another thing in a temporal sense. But it's, this is something I really struggle with, is this the point at which there's a split, the point at which possibility becomes actual, and the point at which um, meaning generates this relationship between an object and a subject. Because that's usually what we think of as meaning. There's a, an idea in, this, in the subject here of this object and it's a relationship. So what we were trying to say was that, no, this meaning is something that gives birth to that kind of a relationship. And it's a, a latent thing. And it's not relational. It's really hard to, to make it out. We, we went through a whole bunch of um, examples to do with non-conceptual content, going into Merleau Ponty's intentional arc and things like this, yes. to try and get a little bit beneath this usual subject-object split, split and mm -hmm. still find meaning there even Gibson's action perception cycles, whole bunch of possibilities for making sense of something like this. Mm -hmm. And Pauli and Jung had a very similar idea where they speak of a, a latent meaning from which things like synchronicities mm -hmm. emerge and so on. Yes. But I agree. I, I have the same, um, the same struggle trying to um, express this in any coherent way. I can sort of fe um, feel it more than I can say it. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, very difficult. Yes. Yeah, well, because it immediately brings up the, the notion of consciousness and not necessarily restricted to humans, but of course we are humans. So it brings up the notion of human consciousness and the relation of that uh, to meaning. And so when I think of a possibility space for meaning, I connect with that, probably I derive from it. So at a later stage, so, uh, something that becomes congruent with that initial setting would be how human consciousness is able to make relations which produce meaning for human consciousness, for, right, from that very... But, but, I, but I, again, I can't explain this, but I, I have a feeling, I guess like you do, I have this sort of intuition that is the question to ask here, what is the overlap in the pattern Right between human consciousness being able to make relations which produce the meaning or or produce this feeling that we've achieved meaning mm -hmm. with the pattern of the possibility space of meaning. 
is there's some structural similarity, right? Because you, you, mm. you, of course, you can't start off with human consciousness and that, right? This is before the, there's even anything concrete, which is necessary before mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, human consciousness arises. Maybe. It, de it depends, right? Because if you start with this monism model, with, as you are, or Velman's does, uh, it's mm -hmm. sort of implicit, or in Bohmian terms, it's implicate, right? It's implicit in there, and it's going to come out of that at some point. So there must be some continuity to explain or to, to create the explanatory gap and to explain that. Right? So, so we actually have an explanation and, and not, um, uh, dare I say, an excuse, like, well, it just emerges, right? Or, or yeah. the, whatever other explanations there are out there. And, and, you know, and with all due respect, right? I'm, I'm not trying to belittle anyone yeah. because I know everyone's putting a lot of effort into all of these different ideas. Right. But um, so mm -hmm. uh, if there, if we have, we do know this, right. So we have human consciousness It's able to make relations and that produces what we call meaning or, or I would say meaningful relationships, which means coherent structure. Um, so how, then could we work backwards to the possibility space of meaning? So is this uh, experience we have in, with consciousness producing meaning, is it made possible by that possibility space? Is there a structure in there? Yeah, that's what I want to say myself, but I haven't found a way of making sense of it. I've been trying to find ways, as I say, of getting lower and lower and lower Mm -hmm. by thinking in terms of things like musical meter tonality right. which don't seem to involve a they, they they have this curious um um thing where they're neither quite subject nor object similar mm -hmm. to um, the, you can find a few other things like this but it's this if you can find things like that and still find some sense of meaning in there then you're sort of getting closer to that structure that you're mm -hmm. speaking about I'm I'm trying to make sense of these. This is kind of the thing I'm thinking about now, and I mm -hmm. yeah, and I it, it, still haven't. It, then it would seem to be moving away from spatial temporality. It's not escaping it, but it's moving lower yeah, down, to... right to where those are generated. I mean, right. even um, Schopenhauer has something vaguely similar to this when he talks about music, and he says, in the end, as you're going down into absolute music, I mean, the, the key is in the word absolute there, you're getting rid of these relations between subject and object. You are basically approaching what is what is will, right? In the sense of this, it's almost like a collective unconscious in his sense, this, right, this right. deeper layer of reality. But he doesn't try and explain what he means by right. that and what the structure of it is or anything like that. So he, he would be faced with the same problem. Okay, and the, you know, the, what happens, the miracle thing, the emergence thing. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with this problem. Well, I, I think it's easier to deal with the emergence of consciousness than, you know, with, with what Schopenhauer is dealing with, which goes deeper because that's mm -hmm. how do we explain the unconscious? And uh, of course, as you know, Velmans has the metaphor or the, the image of the iceberg, right? The, 10% or so is above the water. That's our ego. That's our consciousness. And the 90% down there is what Jung would call the unconscious. Freud would probably call the subconscious. And he had a, many more terms for, for different layers there. Uh, but uh, Velmans has this intriguing um, way of phrasing the relationship between that 90% that of the iceberg, which is submerged. All right. So what is supporting it? Well, in that model, mm -hmm. of course, you would call it the sea, right? But he tells me, and, and he has written this, right? That, that that sea, that is the universe, right? So this is reflecting mm -hmm. his idea that, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the Pauli model of the psycho uh, material world, basically. basically. Yeah, the monism, which then develops into this binary. Um, and so there's, there is, uh, that is, compatible with, but I think it goes a lot further than, than Jung's collective unconscious, right? And uh, it, even though it goes a lot further, actually, I think it, uh, as a general system, it seems to be more coherent to me, at least personally.
because mm -hmm. um, uh, because it makes more sense on a cosmological scale. I mean, right? So it's much more controversial, right, to to, to describe the human unconscious as sort of this collective entity. There there are arguments for and against it, but on a cosmological scale, it really seems coherent that you would mm -hmm. say this is the foundation. Right for everything that comes from it, which would include right subsets like you know, conscious human consciousness, and what is generating it, right, which is really inaccessible to us, the, that uh, mm. unconscious, right. And um, uh, here's a, uh, another question for you, which I also posed to Max. It sort of caught him off guard, but you'll see the relevance in a minute here. And that is, have you ever considered the relevance of uh, um, how shall I phrase this uh, uh, savant? Um, uh, what do we want to call them? Uh, savants who have these, abilities. yes, these incredible abilities we do not have. For instance, right, Daniel Tomat can, there's a, there's a famous mm -hmm. video of him last mm -hmm. like five hours, right, reciting the first 22,000 mm -hmm. plus digits of pi, right? Mm -hmm. And um, forgive me, I forget his name, but there's an Israeli doctor. Yeah, there's a guy who does, the, who does the, the drawings, perfect drawings of the cityscapes. Uh, and this one as well, another good example. Yes, uh, yes. This can be. This has been likened to. I say, all right. So this this is mind-boggling. How do we understand it? Well, we can start to understand it in this way: that the entire body, right, is part of an overall processing, thinking, mm -hmm. conscious organism. Right, so uh, uh, a pianist who's performing the third piano concerto of Rachmaninoff live has not memorized every single note of that concerto. You know, he, he has, yeah. but it's here, right? It's, it's in, in the, the body. Yeah. It's in the yeah. body, exactly. And so a lot of this is, is at the quote unquote unconscious level. It's been programmed. This is why I use music. Mm. This is why I yes. use music as the example for that very reason. Which, which is why I, uh, it triggered my memory on this subject um, and why I wanted to bring it up. Even though these examples are not uh, confined to music, of course, as you say, also to art, right? And um, there, there. But but even more spectacularly, there are these savants who, some of them are are blind, and you can play mm -hmm. them classical music, uh, uh, and that they've never heard before, and they immediately play it with consummate skill. Uh, yeah. uh, and so that data, like the twenty two first twenty two thousand digits of pi. That is down there in the unconscious. And, and Alan Snyder, his theory is that these savants somehow have direct access to that uh, data in the unconscious, uh, whereas, of course, we don't. The non-autistic oh, yeah. uh, does not. Don't usually. Uh, don't usually. <clears throat> yes, but there are techniques, of course. Traditionally, there are many techniques uh, of how to try to to program the unconscious to release certain uh, uh, pieces of data up into higher levels where we can grasp it, like the coin trick mm. that I mentioned earlier. But there are many more altered states of consciousness, types of uh, chemicals, LSD, <clears throat> which um, that's also a good, good uh, subject there because uh, what happens with LSD, for instance, is what also happens with uh, certain techniques like meditation, that is, so instead of trying to increase the conscious rational attempt to understand something, uh, the, the usual circuitry connections, right, in the neurotransmitters are now changing routes to, to more less traveled circuits, right? And so it's sort of like uh, when you try to achieve the passive state, that's when you can find the answer. Right. And, and mm -hmm. so once you give up the, the intense, rational attempt at, you know, trying to solve some mathematical problem or whatever it may be, um, that's when these, these infrequent mm -hmm. types of, of neural passageways begin to then reroute and then, right, they connect and you get it. So it's actually a lower level of consciousness that actually gets you those answers that, you know, a higher level of consciousness, higher degree of concentration are not able to supply, right? So, yeah. um, so could it be that, um, right, that this point, right, that, uh, that savants illustrate to us, 
that there is this incredible data available to us that seems superhuman. And some would even yeah. say supernatural, right? But once you understand what's going on, right, when it's, it's completely natural, right? But down there in, in the unconscious realms, right, uh, of our being, right, th that is where we could potentially, right, have clues to solutions that have evaded us in the history of philosophy uh, and, and others. Like the hard problem of consciousness, right, there's a big debate. Uh, between um, some more na naturalistic ways of approaching this and then the Mysterian, quote unquote, Mysterian school like Chomsky, mm -hmm. right? It, in principle, we don't know, but it's a possibility that we, uh, there's some things we may never be able to answer given the fact that we are a human uh, physical being with certain finite structures, a rat, yeah. reaches the limit cognitively and you know so reasoning by knowledge yeah, I mean, look, so, so going back to falsifiability it's something uh, that right. should be that should be testable like if mm. it so we're saying there are ways of dipping and it's a, a prediction of the model by the way that I, in the book mm -hmm. i wrote with harold atlachbacker that with, there should be these exceptional experiences we call mm. them there it's a prediction um and uh, the problem is as you mentioned trying to find ways of getting into those states. But I suppose mm -hmm. the savant syndrome cases could give you some clues by looking at what exactly is going on in their brain, trying to, because they can converse, you can get information. If you could figure out what kind of state they are getting into, if they can, if you can find any kind of clues of the state that they're in, when they're in this, as you say, it's somewhere else. It's, it's um, uh, very non-conceptual, very, very deep. And then, then if you can find ways of mimicking this, then you should be able to have people practicing and drawing these same kind of skills up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've probably, I think most people have had some kind of experience where they wonder where some idea came from or how they wrote sure. a particular book or paper. It's, it's as if you didn't quite write it because you were so intensely focused at at some points we get so intensely focused that it's not really you writing it you're not there you don't have awareness that you're there so it might be so, you know it's as good as something else writing sure it. sure often really. i've had that experience like a penis but the the words i'm typing are coming out of my fingers because yeah. it's, it's somehow you know i programmed a lot in into the unconscious and then that is being released without the necessity of consciousness it's like some people who drive yeah. it, for a while, it's and they go, oh, my God, how did I get home? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's pure body, but um, but words, concept, what look like conceptual content, but it's not. The conceptual content doesn't live in there first and then come, make its way out. It comes out in the process of, through the body bodily processes. Yes, so, yes. Uh, Interesting. Uh, I've never thought about it like that. Really. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's one of it's it's known as a, as a Dr. Zinner question. I like to spring it on on people from a lot of different fields because um, mm -hmm. certainly I do want to bring attention to to people who are are often neglected in society or who may even be exploited. I think you know mm -hmm. savants sometimes I think are exploited uh, for entertainment purposes, which yeah. I think is, is yeah. certainly unethical or immoral. But uh, I do like to, to bring attention to the experience of, you know, people that sometimes, you know, academics, including myself, don't, you know, usually neglect. And th th there, may, there may be things we can learn uh, uh, from, from their experience. Uh, I mean, the look, just, just, just to go back to the, the example of the memory, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot of things to memorize. <laughs> we, we are being asked to suppose that those however many digits of pi are sitting in, in the brain. That's almost, I mean, that sounds less plausible than it, yes. if it's being dragged from somewhere else. Yes. It's being drawn from somewhere else. Right. Mm. Well, we do know that savants, you know, do use some simple memory techniques, yeah, right? For, for instance, with the involving calendars, 
All right. So there's there are certain mathematical yeah. formulae that we know of and that you can that be easily done. But some of these other these other abilities, like the uh, the blind pianist playing uh, uh, Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto upon right. first hearing it, or the twenty two thousand plus digits. Right. These are not. These are not comparable. There is no formula. <laughs> um, I mean, another, uh, example, another example, which is almost like a kind of induced savant syndrome, is where people have accidents. Yes. And they may have a brain contusion or something like that, and then they can suddenly do these things. So something has happened. Maybe it's, we, we usually, I don't know, this might be an explanation that it knocks out some conceptual uh, element that allows them to, being in a more filtered, less filtered state, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It'd be interesting to compare those. those. Well, yeah, the, the, those abilities would seemingly, in principle, seem to be possible for anyone given the right mm -hmm. uh, brain structures or activities or, or states or or whatever is going on right in the brain with that. Um, it, it, it's. So it's, it's, it seems to be certainly not something that, in principle, you have to be born with, right? So it can develop later, as you say, through, through, through various injuries. But, it, it, uh, but anyway, the principle uh, behind the question, the goal of it is, is, uh, right, is there a possibility that these people right, can maybe give us clues about where to look next, Right, to find some of these really, really difficult uh, questions. But in any case, uh, a final question I have for you, which, which uh, is generated by your earlier mention of uh, Jung and Jung's and Pauli's synchronicity. Uh, would you make a distinction between that, which is called synchronicity, and then uh, coincidences? Right, so it, it right. For instance, if if one knows, if one has been trained how to use a card deck for magic tricks, uh, mm -hmm. the, the untrained person right believes this is astounding, is magical, but it's really simple mathematical formulae that are being used. Right, so a lot of astounding coincidences anyone may have in their daily life can really be explained by you know just the nature of probability is mm -hmm. looking at it from a statistical point of view. But so how do we, how do you uh, distinguish or contrast between, you know, something uh, well, normal mm -hmm. as a probabilistic or, I mean, a probability statistical phenomenon, which is not all that astounding when you think of all the possibilities out there, probabilities out there and what Jung and Pauli are calling synchronicity. Yeah, well, it's the. I, I mean, I would distinguish it the same way that they distinguish it, which is, it's there's a meaning component in there. It's not just that it's implausible or improbable. It's it's, it's improbability comes from the fact that this has extreme meaning for you in that moment. So it's as if that the the world is behaving, the outer is behaving like the inner, rather mm -hmm. than the inner reflecting the outer, which is exactly what you should expect from the kind of model. That I was mentioning with this dual aspect mm -hmm. um, monism approach. Right. Obviously, the classic example is the scarab beetle, right? Where Jung was in his mm -hmm. in his office and he was going through some examples that involved the scarab beetle and you know renewing and you know how a death can be like a, a birth and these kind of things. And then a scarab beetle taps on the window and there's an example of him. It, Sure. It, it was improbable given the circumstances, far too improbable given the circumstances. Yes. Well, yeah, I think every human being has probably had these types of experiences. And um, uh, But a subset of that question, which gets to, I think, an even more um, fundamental question is, all right, so, so we have, um, so maybe at a deeper level, may there be more of a connection between synchronicities and the non-meaningful but even astounding coincidences that we experience. So in other words, may both of those reflect some uh, more you know, underlying structure of existence, structure of the cosmos that, uh, so in other words, maybe these, even what we demean by calling coincidence, just, just a coincidence, maybe this is also a manifestation of something that's really astounding in the universe. And that is yeah. maybe the fact of that, it's all structure, 
right? The structure to yeah. it. Uh, and therefore the randomness, like uh, in, in evolutionary biology, for instance, we see all the random parts of a sequence, right? Sort of, and then in, encrypted within that, right? Is the meaningful, productive, generative sequence, right? But so you can't do without the random. And it would seem that even the random can, when you step back and see it from a larger framework, be producing certain order and structure. Yeah. So I you see where I'm getting at here? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, this is where I would differ from Jung and Pauli. So they view synchronicities as something rare and exceptional. Yes. I don't think they're rare at all. I think they're permanent. They're just continuously going on. Um, I think the world is built almost essentially from these synchronicities. The relationship between a subject and an object is a kind of synchronicity, a permanent synchronicity. So, mm -hmm. I, and I think one of his, I think it was one of Pauli's, um, maybe his secretary or a student, Maya, um, who was ha who had a similar kind of viewpoint that there's just permanent synchronicity, mm -hmm. which makes sense. I don't know why they would even why they would have said that it was um, a rare event, given how they defined um, how they defined synchronicities. Right. Maybe because they didn't have this, this. Well, no, it doesn't make sense because Jung had this notion of latent meaning as well. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe they just didn't think think this through. Well, uh, this, uh, uh, depth. yes. Uh, well, I'll give an example because uh, I, I think coincidences, um, what Jung would call a coincidence, is well, it could even be an extraordinary case. But there's no real emotional charge, right? Experienced mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. Uh, right? And uh, I'll give an example. And I say every human being has these experiences. Recently, uh, I was speaking with a colleague in, in Georgia, Tbilisi. And um, uh, by chance, I had happened to come across the name of, of a modern alchemist, right? It's uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily a, a, a topic I'm interested in, but I came across this story of this alchemist uh, named Fulcanelli. And no one even knows if he actually existed, right? So it, it has the tinges of, you know, urban legends, right? Uh, so I, I asked my friend uh, the next day, have you ever heard of this, this Fucanelli legend? And uh, he said, I said, yes. Uh, and uh, and um, so, well, when's the last time you've, thought about Fucanelli, this is uh, 20, 30 years ago, right? So, all right. So the, 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 the extraordinary coincidence was later that day, just hours later, a colleague of my friend emailed him and said, and mentioned Fucanelli. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, yep. that's actually why it's important to know that my friend does not regularly discuss Fucanelli with his, his colleagues. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he right. So I, I didn't experience that synchronicity, but it was mind blowing to me, probabilistically, statistically speaking, right? Oh yeah, I, I have absolutely. Um, I have them all the time. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I had a similar one with. I, I I had just stumbled across the name of an author, Ola Stapledon, mm -hmm. who wrote this book Star Maker, which is apparently a classic. I'd never heard of him before. I get a new student who comes in and almost one of the first things he says, we start talking about science fiction and he mentions Olaf Stapledon out of the blue. Mm. This was a recent one. I also noticed um, that you interviewed um, Tessa Dick on your uh, channel. Yes. I was just trying to watch yes. before yeah. coming on. I was trying to watch it and the exegesis. So suddenly this ex I, I've been going on about this exegesis to various people lately. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Leslie Stein, this is a guy called Leslie Stein who you might, probably want to get on your channel he's he works on mystical experiences he was a Jungian mm -hmm. a Jungian analyst but I mentioned this book to him just uh very recently and he thought it was like a a kind of drug because he just got absolutely obsessed mm -hmm. with this mm -hmm. book and and there you are with a you know uh, <laughs> right one of your right, right. Uh, well I, I, I put it uh... I put it in the category of popular culture, but but that doesn't mean you know that I'm demeaning it because that's popular culture is important to me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. entertainment, music, film, all of this, and I've dabbled in a lot of those fields myself, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it, even at university, right? I I 
became qualified in several different fields. I've just always had sort of interest in, in so many different fields. So I've, I studied ancient literatures, languages, histories, uh, museum administration, and I could go on, but th that's not important. But uh, so what my, my point is, is that I'm not demeaning that by putting it in a category of popular culture, that that's very mm. important. Uh, Beethoven for me is popular culture, right? And uh, it, it also overlaps though with other fields, of course, uh, Dick's work mm -hmm. and, and the exegesis, right? It goes into even information Excellent. physics. Because yeah, he, of course, it's not. It's, it's a kind of Gnosticism plus information theory plus simulation theory. Uh, I would with guess a sort of hero's journey. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I would guess mm -hmm. he got his information model from Wheeler. I'm guessing, uh, since mm -hmm. Wheeler was talking about the its and bits right back in the early '70s, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, uh, you just reminded me of. Some you Please reminded me of something I wanted to mention when you um, were talking about um, information earlier, and you mentioned uh, Shaitin, who has this information mm. ontology. And one of the one of the mistakes, I think, I think he makes it as well. Um, I'm not sure whether he's he's got a different view now. Is that we have this new approach, which is everything is information. It's becoming mm -hmm. quite um, widespread in the quantum computation community sure um and they and they often mention wheeler as you know the guy who sort of came up with this basic idea through his it from bit yes. notion. what it mean what it leaves out this it from bit idea is precisely this element of uh meaning again and wheeler mm -hmm. didn't intend it like this wheeler absolutely had the what he called the observer participator as the central element it's not it from bit that doesn't leave you anywhere. That's just, um, that's missing out this whole subjective side of the equation, which mm -hmm. physics and science often does. But Wheeler's approach was, no, it's the observer that is putting meaning into these bits in the first mm -hmm. place that makes them. It. Mm -hmm. So it's it bit and us that make it. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. it from bit. It from bits uh, a very bad way of, yeah. of, sort of describing the on the information ontology i think well actually this at this point the... yes gregory does recognize that there's an explanatory gap between the two and that's uh connected to the whole issue I was, uh, that i mentioned earlier where he's he he realizes the present predicament both sides are in like the panpsychists uh, uh mm. and then the opposite field right so the, i mean the opposite side that is, there, it, from both angles, there remains an explanatory gap, right? And so he, yeah, he, he is aware of that, and that's the, he recognizes that is our current challenge in science, mm. right, is to somehow bridge the two. Um, but, of course, uh, Gregory's uh, current emphasis for some time now has been less on the it's to the bits, but it's been on the whole question of algorithm, right? So, yeah, yeah. right. So a sort of, uh, I mean, that hasn't resolved the question either, but that's been his, his focus for a while, right? On, on mm -hmm. applying uh, information science and the whole concept of, of structure algorithms uh, to, to biological evolution, actually. So that's what he's currently been interested in, <clears throat> though he has, he still does cultivate an interest in sort of a neo-Pythagorean approach with full realization that, that there are the explanatory gaps in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think I would agree with him. I'm, I'm really impressed with the notion of structure. Uh, and that, for me, is maybe the essence of you know, mathematics, right? It's, it's patterns and, and structure. And mm. um, of how some type of structuring uh, produces right, what we find ourselves in, right, in, in the world. And so some, some principle of structure, I would call it Ellis, Ellis's possibility space. This is really what I mean by structure. This possibility space has some kind of structure inherent or implied mm. or that it certainly emerges from it. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. Uh, there's a recommendation that I've got to give you actually, which is sure, which sure. would bring Ellis, uh, the Arkani Hamed, um, Shaitan's work, and Tegmark's work all together in the same um, system, 
which is mm -hmm. um, Stephen Wolfram's new work oh, on his um, Ruliad. Mm -hmm. So the way he views the Ruliad is precisely this. Um, you start with, the, it's basically the space of all possible rules or algorithms. Mm -hmm. And similarly to um, Arkani Hamed, by using these very simple permutation rules called term rewriting by computer scientists, mm -hmm. which are basically the same kind of permutations, you generate structure very quickly. And um, by doing this in certain ways, you can generate general relativity, quantum theory, and so on, our um, <coughs> fundamental theories, the structure of mm -hmm. our fundamental theories. But yes. he also puts in there um, uh, an observer as a computationally bounded sampling device, essentially. So mm. the reason why we see the world we do, where like there's this infinite possibility space and there's this little finite being that essentially has sort of transducers and is sampling its space from mm -hmm. its particular perspective. And in order to get a full theory of physics, he, he thinks of it as a fundamental real theory of everything. You have to right. put in this sampling system as well as part of the model. Mm -hmm. I think right. I'm very interested in it. I'm working with one of his um, the people from his research group on this at the moment. Well, Gregory, Gregory Chaitin and, and Stephen Wolfram are actually, for the last several years, are very, very uh, close professional friends. And so they, they're in constant dialogue, actually, including on this subject. So th that is, yes, that is um, an approach that you can bring in all of these others, try to and integrate uh, at least certain, the, the certain no, most notable aspects of their system in, in this regard, right? This question of yeah. information, number, structure, um, algorithm, right? And so, yeah. so the, the way Gregory phrases it is, um, right, according to Pythagoras, everything is numbering. God is a mathematician, right? But in this, this mm -hmm. newer view, God is, um, Everything is algorithm and, and God is a programmer, right? So that's the metaphor, mm -hmm. right? The analogy, yeah. that's the starting point. That, that's, that's the starting point. And, um, uh, and he is, right, in constant dialogue with, with Stephen, and uh, who, who is someone I do want to try to you know, do an interview with, maybe even at some mm -hmm. point together with Gregory, because I think they, they make a great, a great pair. And... Um, well, it, it it's all really fascinating, but uh, I, I guess to try to to begin wrapping this up, I, I think the most promising starting point, right, is is really Ellis's concept of a possibility space, and then mm -hmm. uh, the next step is some monistic structure from which the two nodes of uh, of a subsequent binary emerge, and so uh, ontological uh, monism. And an epistemological dualism, as you, as you phrase it, right? So I'm, uh, I'm actually very fascinated and pleased uh, to discover this part uh, of your work, which I was not aware of. This is uh, if I had been, we would have started there. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate your time. This this has uh, been very very enlightening, and I'm mm. sure everyone else uh, has found this enlightening as well. And uh, wish you all the best in your in your research and and, and in and in life in general and let's let's stay in touch dean yeah thanks a lot it was a good discussion yes thank you and everyone else uh thank you for joining me and we'll see you next time uh, be sure to subscribe and support the channel through patreon or paypal thank you goodbye <laughs>